I want to talk about problem solving now. I want to take a very serious look at how we go about dealing with problem solving. And I want to share with you what I consider to be a systematic approach for dealing with problems. So let me sort of give you an overview of, of, of what I want to talk about today. I, I would like to first talk about the fact that as a consultant, there is no question that this is a key aspect to what I do every day as a consultant. Nobody calls you when things are going good. <laughs> they just don't. They don't ever say, hey, Ken, things are going so well, I'd love you to come and watch. It doesn't work that way. The reason I get called is because they, are, they have reached a challenge. And oftentimes, it's some very good trainers that just haven't figured out how to train their way out of this particular problem. And the key in almost every case is having a systematic approach that will always lead you to a solution. I want to focus today on a single system. There's no question that as, you, as I share with you the system that I like to use, I have borrowed pieces from many talented trainers and put a system together that works for my style of training. You have to find a system that works for your style. One of the, par one of the parts of a good system that helps with problem solving is good follow through and good documentation and good record keeping. And I'll talk about that just briefly. And Ultimately, you have to find the system that works for you. My hope is that if, if what I share with you doesn't completely resonate, maybe one portion of it will. And I welcome and encourage you to take whichever parts of what I share with you that you think will work for you and use it in your problem solving. Because for me, this has been a, 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 a system that has worked exceptionally well for me. There are a lot of different problem solving systems. And one of the advantages of a good problem solving system is it provides you with an objective examination of the problem. Additionally, what a good problem solving system does is it challenges common assumptions or perceptions. I think we often have prejudices, biases, or assumptions about certain types of animals or certain types of situations, and a good system gets past those biases and really looks at the problem itself. It also, when you're working with more than one trainer, whether it be a group of people in a family, in a household, or whether it be in a professional working situation, it improves communication with everyone who's involved in working with that animal. It allows them to provide input, and it gets buy-in into the system. Most important, a good problem-solving system treats the causes of the problem, not just the symptoms. Oftentimes, it's quite easy to cover up the problem because we are only treating the symptoms. We're only treating what we see as opposed to the underlying cause of the problem. A good problem-solving system will get to the cause. A good problem-solving system is solution-oriented, meaning it will produce results. What's the point of going through this whole exercise if in the end you don't have a solution that everybody's comfortable with? And a good problem-solving system has a formalized way of documenting the process so that you can look back on it later, track what you did, go back to it again if the problem resurfaces. There's a lot of formal systems out there. I mean, starting with Karen Pryor's book, Don't Shoot the Dog, if you think about it, the entire purpose behind that book was to say, well, if you have a dog that's giving you a problem, I suppose you could shoot the dog and the problem would be gone, but you don't have to shoot the dog. And so consequently, her whole premise was here are some things you can look at. And if you look at these things, it can lead you toward a solution. And I'm going to talk more about that a little bit later. Um, I do a course for the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. I've been teaching this course uh, for a long time uh, in Orlando. And that particular course, we teach a hypothesis system, which is a system that Marty McPhee, Michelle Skirsky, and Emily and Salako put together that really looks at utilizing some educated guesses about why you think this problem occurred, which then leads you to a series of investigations that help you solve the problem. I find that to be a very worthwhile system. Uh, several years ago, I heard Steve and Jen White talking about a system they use, uh, it's sort of a four point, five point system that they use in trying to find solutions to problems that I also found very, very successful. They talked about this at the Clicker Expo several years ago, and I found that to be a really good system. And then, of course, there's my own system that I'm going to share with you, which was documented in a book I published in 1999 uh, called Animal Training. The key, though, is finding the system 
that you like that matches your style of training and following some kind of a systematic, pro systematic process that provides you with the opportunity to follow through and get to a solution. So I'm just going to share with you one system, a system that I have found useful and beneficial to me. The basic system has five steps to it. And I'm going to go through them quickly and then go through them in more detail with each step. The first step is identify the problem. Step number two, determine the cause of the problem, if you can. Step number three is look at the balance of reinforcers and punishers in the environment, which, by the way, we will talk about a lot, reveals motivation. Step number four is then to implement a plan. And step number five is to constantly monitor the plan you will notice that the first three steps are all investigatory. A lot of the problem that most of us have when we problem solve is we jump to step number four. We immediately start trying to implement a plan, but we haven't done the investigation to make sure that the plan we're following is a good plan, that it makes sense for the problem that you're dealing with. So I'm not going to focus on step four hardly at all. It'll be the last half hour I'll talk about implementing a plan. I'm going to assume that as skilled or uh, creative trainers, you know that there's a lot of solutions out there where you can find different solutions, but I'll, I'll point you towards some of those. But I really think where people fail is in doing the investigation and trying to discover the real heart of the problem. So now that we've listed those five, let me talk about each one of those things individually, and then I'll show you this list of five again at the end. So identify the problem. Not always as easy as it sounds. We think, oh, well, the problem is X. But the problem is most behavior is broken into small parts. And often only certain parts need fixing. Behavior is complex. And oftentimes when we're trying to fix the problem, it may not be the entire behavior that's broken down. You know, I've seen people before where they'll say, well, the problem is this dog doesn't like to kennel anymore. Well, okay, but what is the real problem there? What, what, do you think it's because of reinforcement? Is it because they got scared there? Is it because of, you want to look deeper into that problem and understand it a little bit better. You hope that if the trainer has been a good record keeper, which most trainers aren't, um, that they have documented the first occurrence of the problem. So you can look back at that and sort of look for patterns. Oh, did you notice that this problem only occurs on Tuesdays? Did you notice this problem only occurs when this particular member of the family is involved? This particular problem only occurs in springtime. This particular problem only occurs at a certain time of the day. This, you get the idea. You're looking for patterns, but sometimes those patterns are not easy to see. They're a lot easier to see if you can look back at records and look for those patterns and discover if those patterns are there. Part of identifying the problem is doing a little bit of investigation. I always suggest that you meet with everybody involved with that animal as soon as possible to talk about what input they may have. I often will go into a client's home to do a consult and the parents will say, well, we don't need the kids here. It's just, just my wife and I will be able to talk to you about it. I go, no, 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 no. I want to ask questions of everybody who might know this animal. I want the kids to be involved. If I'm working at, at, uh, at, a, at a professional organization, whether it's a zoo or a shelter, I want to talk to the night watchman. I want to talk to everybody that might have some input into what's going on. Because oftentimes, it's, it's those players that you're not thinking about that may have a real input into the problem. I also think it's important to outline the symptoms of the problem so you understand specifically what they are so that you can figure out the cause. What I mean by that is when somebody says to me, my dog won't kennel anymore. Well, what does that look like? In other words, when you look at your dog and give them their whatever the cue is to kennel, does the dog look at you like they've never seen the cue before? Or when you give the cue to kennel, does the dog trot toward the kennel but then at the last minute change his mind and go around it? Or when you give the cue to kennel, does the dog immediately run the opposite direction? Those are three very different symptoms which might lead you to discover the underlying cause or give you a different direction to look for the underlying cause. So just simply stating, here's the problem, you know, it's like going to the mechanic and saying, well, my car just doesn't work. 
Well, well, tell me more about that. What, what, tell me what happens when you turn the key. What does, there's a lot more information that's necessary, and you want to understand that because you're trying to figure out which parts of the problem need fixing. Again, you want to examine records if there are some so you can look for those patterns. And then I suggest that people look at the causes checklist, which I'm going to share with you in a second. To me, the causes checklist is a very important checklist that I always go to to help see if I can narrow down what the cause might be. Then I look at examining motivation. This is all part of the investigative process. Identify the problem, determining the cause, and then examine and evaluate motivation. Now before I get to talking about the cause, a good friend of mine, trainer Steve Martin, not the comedian, but the bird trainer Steve Martin, um, one of the things that he says all the time is uh, he talks about labels getting in the way of finding solutions. And I couldn't agree with him more. So often, trainers come into a problem and go, well, it's a beagle. You know how beagles are. Or, well, this particular animal is, you know, got, is, is got a, 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 a male phobia, or this particular animal hates people in uniforms. As soon as you put a label on the problem, he's phobic, he hates men, he hates large dogs, he doesn't like women, he doesn't like big hats, he doesn't like the color red, whatever, it, it seems to make the trainer believe that it somehow absolves them of responsibility. It's, it, it's not my fault, it's that particular breed. It's not my fault, it's that he's phobic, it's that he's this, that he's that. And it, it, it immediately sort of distances you from the problem. And if you want to solve a problem, I believe we as trainers need to shift our thinking. We need to quit saying what's wrong with the animal and ask ourselves, why can't I figure out how to train this? I am the trainer, I need to accept responsibility that this is my job to figure out the solution. Because as soon as we put those labels on it, it makes it difficult to fix. It does. Because we've kind of said, well, it's because of this. You've given yourself a reason. You've given, given it a cause. And you're not able to really focus in on the problem. So one of the things I like to do once I've really investigated the problem is see if I can determine the cause. Now many, many, many years ago when I was a young wee trainer, uh, I worked for an organization called Active Environments, and Tim Desmond and Gail Lally, whose names are up there at the bottom right-hand corner, wrote a training manual that we were all given, and in it, they point out that there are only eight causes of problem behavior. Now, being the skeptical young trainer that I was, I believe there had to be more than eight causes of problem behavior. But nonetheless, I learned them and used them in our problem-solving approach. And I'm going to list them here, and then I'm going to go over them individually. They list the eight causes of problem behavior as being environmental, social, psychological, physical, the trainer, session use, regression, and desensitization. And many years later, as I have gained more experience and I look back at this list, I have two comments. One, I have yet to find anything that falls outside of that list. And, and additionally, when I work with trainers, they go, well, I would think that XYZ is another cause. Fine. Add it to your list. What I have found is having a list is beneficial. Because so often when we can't solve a problem, we have to go back and sit down and think about it a little bit and say, okay, have we looked at all environmental causes? Have we looked at all social possible causes? Have we looked at cycle use? And by having a checklist, and each thing on that checklist has a subset of like 10 or 12 other things that can help us narrow down and find a solution. So I just think having a list is helpful. Whether you think there should be two more things on the list or 10 more things on the list, that's up to you. Create your own list. I find this eight-point list to be very satisfactory and beneficial for me. I think we all know that animals are impacted by their environment. And consequently, radical, dramatic, unique changes to the environment can and will affect behavior. Whether it be changes in the weather, it's too hot, too cold, first time this animal's ever seen snow, changes in barometric pressure, the wind, all of those things can affect an animal if they've never experienced it before. And we have to recognize that it can cause behavior to break down. 
And sometimes it just takes a little while for them to get used to it. You also have to look at the changes in the environment, the facility. Did you just move a new plant into your house? Did you just repaint the living room? Did a, did a lightning storm just knock down that big tree that used to be in the yard? Those kinds of changes affect the way an animal sees the world. And you have to remember that many of the changes in the environment are things that we can't see. It smells, it sounds. Our, our dogs, our animals are far more perceptive of the world around us than we are sometimes. And we go, I don't see anything different. But they certainly hear it, or they smell it, or they sense it, or they feel it. So when you're looking at the environment, you have to consider more than just what is blatantly obvious. There's lots of different senses that that animal can pick up on that could be a significant change in that animal's environment. You also have to look at things that you use every day, prop changes. The fact that you've got a brand new clicker that sounds a little different. The fact that you've got a new target that, is, that smells different or looks different. The fact that you're wearing new clothes or you have whatever. All of those things can be changes in the environment. I want to share a story with you, something that happened to me uh, a few years back. I was working in Mexico City, and I was a dolphin trainer for a large uh, program there, and I was in, in charge of the dolphin program. And in our dolphin show, I had three dolphins that were this phenomenal, superb show team. They, their behaviors were sharp, they were exciting, they worked really well together, and I'd worked with this team of dolphins for over three years. And on this one particular day, I was performing and we had several thousand people in the audience. It's important because lots of people watching sometimes changes our behavior and how we respond to our animals. So normally when we would do a show, the narrator, who was a local college student who was narrating in Spanish to the audience there in Mexico, um, I would run out, start my session, and our, the three dolphins in the show would line up at station right in front of me, one, two, three, right where I could get to them, I could touch them, I could reinforce them. But on this particular day, as we ran out to start the session, I called the animals to station and they lined up like, like 15 feet out in the middle of the pool. <laughs> Perfectly lined up. <laughs> Ready to work, but not where they were supposed to be. But the narrator, not being a trainer, not being very observant, didn't notice this anomaly, and he proceeded to say, and now the dolphin's gonna leap into the air, welcoming everybody to the show. And I thought, but they're, they're way over, okay. So I gave the cue. And they took off, and they did this porpoising just perfect. And I thought, oh, excellent, all right. I blew my whistle, I used a whistle instead of a clicker, and hoped they would line up here in front of me, but they didn't, they lined up way out there. I thought, well, I got thousands of people watching. I should probably reinforce them. So I tossed them fish. Then I got a target out and tried to target them closer. They would come an inch closer, but always return back to that spot. And I thought to myself, there must be something different in the environment. I looked around, I looked at me, there was nothing. But I didn't have a lot of time to think because again, my, my very verbose and unobservant announcer <laughs> goes on to say next, the next thing we were supposed to do is normally I would shake flippers, shake hands with each one. <laughs> and so he goes on to say, and now Ken is going to greet each one of the dolphins. And all I could do is go, hi, hello, hi. And I turn around, look at him, go, what are you doing? Don't you see that way out there? So we go on with the show and we managed to do a good show. It was a, a very difficult show because I had to work around what the animals could do. Now fortunately these were very acrobatic animals, they did lots of behaviors that didn't require touching. So we were able to get through the show and at the end of the show I was like, oh my goodness, thank goodness that was over and I had a brief discussion with the narrator about what to do the next time something like that happened. But now I was more concerned about the behavior. I thought to myself, all right, let me wait for the audience to leave and then I'm gonna work on this. And so I would get on my knees and try to target them closer. And with a little bit of effort, I could get them to come five or six inches closer, but they always drifted back to that spot way out there. And I thought, okay, I know my checklist. This is obviously environmental in my opinion. The backdrop hadn't changed. I said, I bet there's some unique sound underwater or something. So I went and changed into a wetsuit and went scuba diving down and I'm looking and I'm listening. And now of course the dolphins are all over me. They're all over like, what you doing Ken? What you doing? And they're all right there. And, and I'm going, shh, I gotta listen. 
<laughs> and I'm listening, I don't hear anything. I don't see anything, any, nothing looks different. I go out and sit in the audience and look at the, at the stadium. Again, I don't see anything different. And I'm really perplexed by this. And, and I'm thinking, there's got to be something. And then I, I, I finally got changed and got ready to do the next show. Decided to try a little session before we opened the stadium to the public again. But again, they lined up way out there. I thought, I don't know what to do. So I decided to call uh, my assistant trainer. Her name was Mary Claire. She worked two days a week. I worked six days a week. She worked two days a week. We overlapped one day. And I said, Mary Claire, I'm, I don't know what's going on with these dolphins, but I'm, I've got a challenge. I was wondering if you would mind coming to work today and helping me figure out what's going on. And she said, sure, love to. But she lived too far away to make it for the next show. So we had another show. The animals did the same thing, lined up out there, but this time the narrator and I were in sync. I didn't have to do a silly little wave or anything. I was able to do a normal thing. And we got through it, but we, they still stationed way out there. So about 30 minutes before the third show, Mary Claire finally arrives. And she's a young, new trainer, just learning to work with the animals. And so I say, here's what I'd like you to do, Mary Claire. I'd like you to go sit in the audience. And I want you to just watch. I want you to watch for anything that either I'm doing that's different than you do. I want you to look to see if you see anything happening behind me or see anything from the audience perspective. And, and maybe we can figure out, because this is what they've been doing. I explained to her what they've been doing. So the audience was filtering in, and we talked about it for a while. It was about 10 minutes before the show, and I went, wait, oh, I got a better idea. You know, I have so much more experience than you, Mary Claire. <laughs> Maybe I would be the one, I should be the one to sit in the audience. I want you to do the show, and I'll go out with my notepad and I'll take notes. And she's going, well, what am I, what am I going to do? So they're going to line up over there. And I said, well, hopefully they won't. But if they do, you call them in, you try to get them, and then just do the show. I'm sure they'll line up just like this, and this is what you'll do. And I talked her through what to do with each behavior. She says, is that okay? And I go, well, normally it wouldn't be okay, but yes. So got it all figured out. So I go sit with my pad of paper in the audience watching. And it's time for the show to start. The narrator starts talking. She runs out, calls the animals, and they line up. Boom, 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 right there. <laughs> and I, she looked at me in the audience, and all I could do is go. <laughs> so the animals proceed to do a perfect show. No problems, no lining up way over there, perfectly lined up. And I thought, OK, whatever it was, they're over it. No problem. So show is over, and I come up and go, really good job, Mary Claire. Obviously, whatever the problem is, is, is done. But let me just check. And I got my buckets, and I called the animals to station, and they lined up out there. <laughs> and I thought, oh my god, it's me. <laughs> it's me. What could it, how, I've, I've known these animals for three years. I, I, Mary Claire's brand new. What is this about? I was, it was an ego deflating moment. But it also was a perplexing moment, because why in the world would they work really well for Mary Claire? And they actually worked well for me, they just didn't want to be close to me, they wanted to be way out there. And I thought, this, this doesn't make any sense. So I, we went back to our office, and I remember I sat down, and I, I, was, really, I was really depressed, I mean, I was really upset. And I sat down and I, was, I had my head in my hands going, I just don't get it. Just don't get it. And I ended up putting my feet up on the table. And she said, what's that on the bottom of your boots? And I said, what do you mean? And I had forgotten that I had some brand new boots that I was wearing that day that on the outside, from the top, looked exactly the same. But instead of having black soles, they had white soles. And oh, by the way, did I forget to mention that the edge of the stage in Mexico City was made out of plexiglass? So that when I stood there, my belief now is that the white, the reflection off the white soles startled them too much and they had to station farther back. I saw those white soles on the bottom of my boots and I ripped my boots off, went and got my old boots, put them on, ran out, called the animals to station and they lined up perfectly right there. <laughs> so the moral of the story, wouldn't it be nice if you could just change your shoes and fix all of your behavioral <laughs> problems? But the real moral there to me is I couldn't see it. I, I just couldn't see it. And oftentimes that's the case. It's either because I'm not observant enough or it's just not something that's within my ability to see for whatever reason. But it doesn't mean it's not environmental. You also have to be concerned when I think about the environment of, of other people. 
you know, in my house, it's the, the mailman coming by, the UPS driver coming by, um, in a zoological facility, the guests, when you're taking your dog out for some kind of competition or some kind of a thing. There's all sorts of people that can affect your animals, and that's part of the environment as well. There are a lot of environmental issues that can impact our animals. I also have to ask, is it a social problem? And I'm gonna, I, I hesitate to click the button and show you the next word because as I learned yesterday, it's controversial. <laughs> uh, you have to ask yourself, and I'm, I'm gonna say dominance in the biological sense, the ethological sense, not in the sense of whatever dog trainers now have come to think dominance means. What I mean is exactly what Trisha said yesterday, the animal that, that sort of gets to a resource first in, in, a, in a particular situation. And, and in most animal structures, there is some sort of a social structure that exists. And whether you call it dominance and submissiveness or you call it anything else, the reality is you have to be aware that there is a social structure there that impacts how well an animal learns. And often, the social reinforcers and social punishers that animals offer to each other will far outweigh what we have to bring to the table. And we have to be aware of that. Whatever you call that structure, there is a social interaction that occurs that impacts behavior. And it changes the way animals learn. The other thing that I've also learned is when you're working with groups of animals, which I do a lot, I frequently am working with groups of 5, 10, 12, 20 animals at a time. Inevitably, whichever animal is doing the most um, uh, resource guarding or chasing or exerting their dominance in one way or another, oftentimes, as trainers, we get upset with that animal that appears to be at the top of the hierarchy and we feel really sorry for the one at the bottom that's being picked on. But I gotta tell you that every animal in that social hierarchy is feeling pressure. Every animal in that social hierarchy is, is dealing with stress. If you look at, at, at our own human society, the highest incidence of ulcers in the business world are with CEOs. They're top of the structure. They're the top. It's hard to stay at the top. It's hard, but it's also hard to maintain whatever position you're in socially. So every animal in that hierarchy is dealing with social pressures. They just all show it in different ways. And you have to sometimes ask yourself whether it's the social setup. Do I need to work with my animals separately? If I can't work with them separately, do I need to change where I work with them? Can I change something that will help them deal with whatever social issues they're dealing with? And whatever you want to call it, those are important things to those animals. I also think we have to be aware of aggression. Like Tricia said yesterday, I agree, dominance is not necessarily about aggression. But aggression is certainly an issue that happens within social structures that you have to be aware of. And when there is aggression occurring, I'm not going to talk about aggression a lot today, but aggression is a powerful thing. And the animal that succeeds in an aggressive encounter is very reinforced, and the animal that loses in an aggressive encounter is it's very aversive. And animals learn quickly when they are dealing with aggression. And if you have aggression within a group of animals that you're dealing with, you have to get control of that or it will impact that animal's ability to learn. You also just have to be aware that it is natural for, for, for most animals to compete for food, for resources, for toys, for your attention, for a mate, for a nesting site, for whatever. It's just natural. And so you have to set up a training session where your animals don't feel like they have to compete where you are treating each one where, where, as they appear it, as they perceive it, as being fair. That they have equal access to every reinforcer, to every toy, to your, your attention, etc. You also have to be aware that during certain times of the year, whether it's an animal that's in heat or a variety of sexual activity that an animal wants to engage in, mating and breeding behavior, that that's a powerful thing that impacts their ability to learn. Often when you know or you see or you discover that the problem is social in nature because it's one of these things, you then have to take a different approach to solving the problem because you have to deal with the social issues that are important to that animal. So again, I'm not telling you how to solve every problem. This is just the beginning of the, of the, of the problem solving method. You're just trying to determine, is it this? Then if you decide it's this, then you go to the next step and look at other things. 
Psychological. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. This is the most difficult one to deal with, but fortunately it is the most seldom seen. But it's the ones we hear about most because they're such serious problems. Psychological problems are ones that are deeply rooted. They can be caused by boredom. Um, they can be neurotic or aberrant behavior in nature. And you have an animal that licks its paws until its fur comes off and they just won't stop. Uh, they, birds that pluck their feathers until they're bald. Uh, animals that will regurgitate just, just because it's self-reinforcing. These kinds of problems are difficult. The thing about dealing with psychological problems is you have to realize that there's, a, there's different approaches to dealing with these problems. Sometimes it requires digging into your classical conditioning tool bag. So often when we talk about training in so many of our circles, we focus on operant conditioning. But classical conditioning is just as important. And oftentimes these psychological problems become deeply rooted reflexes, deeply rooted instinctive responses that are now classically ingrained in the animal's psyche and it requires understanding classical conditioning to get rid of them. And it's beyond the scope of a one day seminar to talk about classical conditioning. Sometimes deeply rooted psychological problems become medical in nature and thus require the counsel, the advice, and the input of a veterinarian who can really look at some of the medical issues that this animal is facing because of these psychological problems. Fortunately, psychological problems are few and far between. Unfortunately, they're the biggest ones that we get called in on because it's difficult to fix them. They are self-reinforcing, they are ingrained, they keep happening, and it's hard to get rid of them, and it takes a much different approach to solving. But if you know it's psychological, at least you know where to start. You also have to ask yourself, is it physical? Is it a health problem, for example? Fortunately, most of us who work with our animals every day can look at our dog in the eyes, can look at our dog's behavior, can sense that our dog is not behaving normally, and we immediately say to ourselves, I don't think he's feeling very well today. And we can take them to the veterinarian, sure enough, find out that there's a problem. Or if we're lucky, and I say lucky in, in the broadest sense, we can see the problem. They're limping, we go, oh, their, their paw hurts or their leg hurts. That'll gear us toward where we need to go to solve a problem. But I also think we have to remember and keep in mind our animals' body capabilities. Sometimes animals will surprise us and do this miraculous behavior, but they were lucky. They did it once, but they may not be physically capable of doing it on a regular basis. Or, what's more common these days, is modern medicine has done a wonderful job of extending the lives of our animals. And because they live so much longer than they used to, they experience geriatric problems. They have loss of hearing, loss of vision, they have arthritis. And these are invisible problems to the owner because they come on gradually and we don't see them. One day the animal was working perfectly well and then all of a sudden today it won't do the behavior anymore. It won't go into the kennel because it's too dark and its vision has gone and it's scared to go into this dark place that wasn't so dark and scary before. Or they won't do this behavior that they used to do so well because jumping up onto this platform hurts too much because they have arthritis. But because that arthritis came on slowly, we weren't able to see it. We sometimes have to realize that as our dogs reach a certain age or our pets reach a certain age, they may not be capable of doing all of the things they did before. I'm going to show you a video clip here of a, a, a sea turtle that we have at the aquarium. And this was a, a, re, a lot of our animals at the aquarium are rehabilitated animals. And this is a sea turtle that was injured. Um, and because of that, a, a boat propeller ran over her backside and now she is positively buoyant on her rear end. And so when she swims, her rear end is up and she swims at this very odd angle. And it makes it very difficult for her to be able to do a lot of things. And so um, in this particular video, you can see her in this uh, kind of, her tail end is up in the air. That's the way she always swims. Um, and one of the things that we really had to do to be able to work with her is her weight was a critical issue for our veterinarians and being able to deal with her weight was something we really had to consider. But the problem is her unusual swimming pattern made it very, very difficult for us to get her onto a platform and onto a scale. So we really had to be very, very creative in designing a weighing system that, that would work for her. If we felt that getting her weight was important, we had to design a special weighing system. Teaching her to target wasn't hard. She gets these little sushi rolls that squid with uh, lettuce wrapped around it. This is the platform that we would normally weigh an animal on. And 
But the problem is because it was so difficult for her to get into it, what we did is we created the platform where it would go underwater and she could swim into it. But because of her buoyant rear end, we also had to have these safety straps to help strap her in. So here you can see two of our staff, this is Michelle and Lisa, working really hard on targeting her into the straps, reinforcing that, and then desensitizing her to being able to put these straps around and strap her in so that we can lift her and weigh her. The point I'm making here is it required a sacrifice on our part and being able to spend some money if we really wanted to do this behavior. We don't have a problem doing the behavior, but we had to create this whole device to make it possible for this behavior to be successful. How much does she weigh? How much does she weigh? She weighs 225 pounds, more or less. Uh, so she's, she's, a, she's a good sized sea turtle. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about sea turtles in my afternoon, my last talk of the afternoon. But you can see this took time. It takes time to strap her in it. And the reality is we had to recognize that her body capabilities meant that if we needed to get a weight, we weren't going to be able to do it unless we created something special. Otherwise, it just was not going to be possible because of her, the limitations that her body presented to her. So you have to think about those kinds of things, and sometimes it requires putting forth a little bit of money to make it work, or else you have to decide, I guess that weight wasn't as important. Well, it was important to us, and so we, we did take care of doing that. You also have to ask yourself, is it me? Well, not, not is it Ken, but is it, is it me, the, is it, are, am I the problem as the trainer? You have to ask yourself, am I working beyond my skill level? Is it possible that I'm in over my head, that I'm dealing with a task that I just don't have the experience to handle? Or sometimes, for experienced trainers, the, often the biggest problem is going back to basics. You have to remember, it doesn't matter how good of a trainer you are or how experienced you are, some of those basic skills like clear cues, good reinforcement history, the way you use your marker signal, are always important. And if you ever allow those basics to falter, if you ever allow yourself to not pay attention to those things, sometimes that can be the very thing that's causing you problems. Ask yourself, is it basics? Do I need to go back to basics? You have to ask yourself, are my emotions getting in the way? I love the fact that Trisha talked about this a little bit yesterday, in that I think being emotional is a big part of what makes us human. It's what makes us compassionate, what makes us care. But I also think that sometimes emotions can cloud good logical thinking. And I think we just have to be careful that we are not always doing our training session when we're in, an, in, a, in a bad mood. You know, I'll, every time I start my training sessions, when I get home and I've just had a terrible day at work and I've dealt with three hours of traffic and so come here dog, we're gonna train right now. And it's like, all of a sudden, you're just not really in the right mood for it. But it's not only, it's not only bad negative emotions, positive emotions can get in the way as well. Um, a story that I tell in my book, uh, something that happened uh, at the aquarium, I got a phone call from the boyfriend of one of the trainers that worked for me. Now that was kind of an odd thing. Why is the boyfriend of this trainer calling me? Um, so he came to see me, had an appointment to see me, and he wanted to propose to his girlfriend, but he wanted to do it during one of our dolphin shows. Well. I'm a pretty romantic guy, so I thought, yeah, that sounds fun, I'll help you out. So we had this portion of our show where the narrator would come out and say, so who would like to meet a dolphin today? And inevitably we had half the audience would raise their hand, um, certainly all the kids, and a lot of women, seldom men, it was weird, you know, I have a couple guys go, yeah, I want to pet a dolphin. But, <laughs> but, but we always got a lot of hands in the air. And then we would pick somebody, bring them down, put them in boots, and then they would meet a dolphin. So in our pre-show meeting, we would predetermine which dolphin it was going to be and which trainer was working with that dolphin, but the narrator would just randomly pick somebody from the audience. So on this particular day, it had been pre-set up between me and, and Margo's uh, uh, boyfriend, his name was Glenn, that he would be sitting in a certain place in the audience and the narrator knew to pick him. Now Margo, our trainer, was not surprised to see him in the audience because they had plans to eat lunch together after the show. But she was surprised when he raised his hand. But again, she just thought, oh, Glenn, he's such a crazy guy. All right, he raised it. She still didn't think anything of it. So he raised his hand, and our narrator says, narrator goes, sir, yes, you, please, come on down. What's your name? He goes, my name's Glenn. Well, come on with me. We're going to put you in some boots. So then we get down um, where we're supposed to meet the, the animal. And of course, Margot is 
already knew she was going to be meeting whichever guest we picked. Uh, much to her surprise, it's her boyfriend. And, and so the narrator goes, so, sir, uh, your name's Glenn, where are you from? And as he put the microphone in front of Glenn's mouth, Glenn took the microphone away, which is what we had pre-planned, and said, well, actually, um, I'm actually Margot's boyfriend, and he reached in his pocket, and he got this thing, and he got down on one knee, and he proposed. So, now, I had anticipated that she might want to hug him or something, assuming she's going to say yes, I <laughs> that she might want to hug him, so I had another trainer ready to take over the dolphin, but this happened so quickly that he goes, will you marry me? And she goes, well, yes, I'll marry you. She goes, she's all teary-eyed, so teary-eyed that she didn't pay any attention. She reached into her bucket of fish, she goes, yeah, me. and she just keeps tossing <laughs> fish into the water. We had six dolphins at different locations. They all left their trainers to come get all this free fish that had been thrown into the water. And she goes, oh, I'll marry you, you're so sweet, I love you. And, and, and it was disaster. It took us seven minutes just to get our animals paying attention to it because there was all this free fish floating around. The point I'm making is whether you're angry, you're frustrated, you're deeply in love, you're elated, whatever, those kinds of emotions often keep you from thinking like a good trainer. And you have to keep those things in check. The same thing has, goes with attitude. You know, when a trainer comes in to, say, to, a, to a training situation saying, well, that's impossible, I can't train that, well, then you're right. You won't be able to train it. I got to tell you, I, when I got put in charge, I came to the aquarium 22 years ago to be in charge of the marine mammal training program. It was about 10 years ago that my boss, the CEO of the organization, said, Ken, I think you should be in charge of all the animals. And so I decided I wanted to train the octopus and the, uh, the sharks, etc. Well, I got to tell you, as soon as I started working with our shark folks on training our sharks, our, our lead aquarist in that area was so against the idea, she thought it was so stupid, that she was the worst trainer I'd ever seen. Over the years, we figured out a way, we finally were, were able to get a, a um, uh, we were on the Discovery Channel for Shark Week, and I decided, normally I'm the spokesperson, and I normally do all the talking about training and, and so forth, but I decided to let her be the spokesperson. And as soon as she was the spokesperson, the, following, the week following that episode airing, every colleague who works with sharks around the world was calling her saying, that was so neat, can you tell us how you did it? After that, she became the best trainer I'd ever worked with because all of a sudden it was important to her. It wasn't just her boss, some mammal guy telling her she had to train sharks. All of a sudden her colleagues, and all of a sudden because her attitude was, they think this is good, I really want to do this, all of a sudden she went from being the worst trainer I'd ever worked with to one of the best. Her knowledge didn't change a bit. Her attitude is what changed. It can make a huge difference. Look at the trainer and ask, is it me? You also have to look at session use. How is your session being utilized? And whether it be, did you go into the session planning appropriately? Oftentimes, if you go into a session and halfway through the session you have no idea what you're going to do next, you find yourself delaying and thinking and you lose your animal's interest. You lose your animal's attention because you didn't plan properly. You also have to ask, how about the number of sessions? I mean, Trisha gave us some really interesting data yesterday, but every animal's different. I also think you have to look at the frequency of sessions. Are your sessions too close together? Are they too far apart? All of these things can make a huge difference. You also have to look at pacing. You have to ask yourself, not every animal works at the same pace. I tend to be a very frenetic trainer. What I mean by that is I move at a really fast pace. I am just nonstop. I want my animals moving. I like to move really, really fast. And for me, it keeps me going. It keeps most of the animals I work with going. Not every animal likes that pace. I remember in our Amazon exhibit, we have uh, three different species of monkeys. And our monkey training program is, is, is done exceptionally well. Well, you can imagine having 32,000 animals at the aquarium. I don't personally train all 32,000 animals. There are a handful that I work with every, every week. But there are some that I don't work with that often. 
and we were just making some really good breakthroughs with our monkeys and uh, the staff had invited me up to watch the training. So I was up watching and we were getting ready for the session. We were waiting and waiting and one of our aquarists who was part of the training team was late. We kept waiting and waiting and it looked like he wasn't going to show up and so the supervisor of the area says, Ken, well, do you want to help with the session? I go, sure, I'd love to. And uh, well, we had just we had just taught the monkeys to get comfortable sitting on this branch, right at eye level, where we could do all of this work with them. And so we came in, started the session, the animals all came down, and I responded with my typical enthusiasm and said, good boys! And all the monkeys ran to the top of the trees, <laughs> and they didn't come down for another week. <laughs> I haven't been invited back to a monkey session since. <laughs> You have to be aware of the pacing, and sometimes the pace with which you work your animals needs to be varied just for variety's sake, but you need to be aware that not every animal works at the same pace. You need to find a pace that's comfortable for their learning style. I also think you have to look at the concept of balance of reinforcement. Oftentimes we get into the habit of doing our session in the same place, same time, same location every day, and the animals get really good at working right there. But if you really want your animals to be good at working everywhere, you have to get them used to working at different locations. I want to show you a video clip here that's a, a really good example of that. Um, all of the sea otters that we have at the Shedd Aquarium are, were rescued from the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1989. Since then, we've gotten many, many rescued animals. We are one of the premier facilities at dealing with rehabilitating otters. The thing about sea otters is a lot of their survival skills are learned. They're not instinctive. And so orphaned animals often cannot survive in the wild. So after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, we were asked if we would take in four uh, and then eventually five of these pups that had been orphaned. But part of us taking these pups in meant that we had to work with the government and promised that we would take blood samples from these otters weekly for one year to assess the effects of oil long term on their systems. And so we said, sure, we'll do that. Now, the problem is that as young pups, they were not yet trained to sit still for a blood sample. They're trained to do that today, but they certainly weren't trained to do that when they first arrived. So what we did was we called them into this hallway, and then once they were in the hallway, we would restrain them and get a blood sample. Well, you can guess about two weeks into this process, the otters were going, you know, I don't think I want to go to that hallway anymore <laughs> because our balance of reinforcement was off. So what I suggested to our staff is that we create, otters are extremely curious animals. And I said, let's be creative. Let's be inventive. Let's make the, the hallway the most fun place in the world to be. Put ice in there, put shellfish in there, put toys in there, put pool, little pools of water in there. In fact, what I want you to do is every single day, I would like you to come up with something different. In fact, we're going to do play sessions in that hallway three or four times a day, every day. And sure enough, after doing that, with, we only had two weeks where the otters did not reliably come into the hall. After we started doing those play sessions four times a day, every single day, they always came into the hall, even though we were doing blood samples in there once a week. So I challenged our trainers to be creative, and I said, you know what, let's videotape all of the sessions. So this was a year's worth of doing this. We ended up with 400 hours of video. <laughs> One of our trainers, bless her heart, Meg, took the time to go through this video, pick out the cute shots, well, cute shots, that's three and a half hours of video. I mean, the <laughs> otters, are, you know, that's, that's, there's a lot of, that's, there's, they're, they're very cute animals, but, and then she put it to music. And so we used this for a, uh, a, a conference to show people what we were accomplishing. But to me, it's a lot about balance and reinforcement, and it's just a chance for me to quit talking for a few seconds, because this is such a serious topic that I have to, all these stories to share with you. So let me just show you this video clip and uh, let you watch it. It's about four minutes long.
Again, to all the point, I, besides just wanting to take a break at the halfway mark here on this discussion of, uh, of uh, problem solving with some kind of fun video, it was important to look at balance of reinforcement and look at the way we used our sessions. Because the only thing we did in that hall was not fun, of course they didn't want to come in there. But by making it so much fun they couldn't resist coming in, the number of times that, we, that it was fun, once a week, blood got taken. But four times a day, they had fun like this. It made it a very, very strong and reliable behavior. And that's what I mean by balance of reinforcement. Um, the last two are not quite like the first six in the list of things that you look at to determine the cause. And one is regression. And that is just a reminder to the trainer that regression is a normal part of every animal's learning curve. You learn, a, you learn a lot, you forget a little. You learn a lot, you forget a little. An animal shouldn't continue regressing, but some regression is normal. And finally, desensitization. Desensitization is an ongoing process that never, ever, 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 ever ends. No matter how hard you try to desensitize your animal to all the things that they might experience in their life, there's always going to be something that they haven't been desensitized to. I always like to tell our staff that we want our beluga whales to be so trusting of us and be, have desensitized them to so many things that if one day a tornado came down and ripped the roof off of our building, the belugas would go, well, look at what the trainers are doing today. <laughs> Now, I guarantee they'd be freaked out. They wouldn't go, oh, it's just another desensitization game. But you hope that your animals learn to trust you and that they begin to learn that if you're there, things are going to be okay. But the reality is you can never desensitize your animals to everything. So it's an ongoing process that never ends. So that list, again, if, if you think there's more than these eight things, that's fine. Add them to the list. But having a checklist is a wonderful tool because that's what I go back to when I think I'm stumped. I cannot figure out what this problem behavior is. I then ask myself, well, is it environmental? Might it be social? Could it be psychological? Could it be physical? And I begin to check things off the list and say, definitely not, maybe, good possibility, no, I don't think so. And then I begin to work toward if I can figure out what the solution is or what the, the, the cause is, maybe I can make some changes. However, 
Before you implement a plan, I have to remind you that determining the cause is not always possible. Maybe the cause of the problem happened in the middle of the night yesterday and you weren't there. You weren't there to see it and you'll never see it. And you'll never know for sure what it was. Or sometimes knowing the cause doesn't present an immediate solution. For example, the day you bring your newborn baby home from the hospital and your dog's behavior changes dramatically, you, get, you can very quickly assume, uh-oh, newborn baby, that's the cause of the problem. But you're not going to get rid of the baby and you're not going to get rid of the dog. And so oftentimes you're stuck saying, okay, I know the problem, but I don't have an immediate solution. So this is where the use of behavior analysis comes in handy. This is where I find using some of those advanced training concepts really come into play. And so, what I, what, what one of the things that I think is oftentimes people jump, as I said before, to trying to solve a problem and trying to implement a plan, but these investigative steps are so useful in being able to find a way to put the right plan in place. So when I say behavior analysis, what do I mean? I'm talking about determining the balance of reinforcers versus punishers. We know, if we are a good student of behavior, we know that if a behavior has increased in frequency, that it has been reinforced. So we want to ask ourselves, this unwanted behavior is increasing in frequency, what is the reinforcer? Or, you say to yourself, the good behavior is disappearing. What do we know if we've studied behavior that decreased behavior means that it's been punished? What's the aversive? What's punishing this behavior? I'm not suggesting that you as a trainer are using an aversive or a punisher, but if a behavior is disappearing or declining in frequency, by definition, it has been punished. So something in the environment must be punishing the desired behavior. You can choose to focus on one or the other. And that's where those of you that have studied behavior and looked at that weird matrix of, of positive reinforcers and positive punishers and negative reinforcers and negative punishers, and do I really need to know that stuff? No. To be an excellent trainer, you don't need to know the definitions of those kinds of things. But if you want to be a good problem solver, you need to be able to understand that it is reinforcers or punishers that are impacting behavior. And it's things added or removed from the environment that cause that to happen. And if you can figure out which one it is, you can then change that balance of reinforcement or punishment so that you fix the behavior and get the behavior you want back. So let's take a hypothetical problem. Let's say, and this is an easy problem because I don't have hours to solve this with you today. Let's say you have a previously reliable search and rescue dog who has recently lost focus. I love that term, focus. Has recently lost focus during your training sessions. He runs through the environment searching every place except the location of the actual victim, almost as if he's avoiding the victim. It's almost like he's searching everywhere else that it's like he knows where it is, he just doesn't want to find them. Now, in a real problem, it would, a more difficult problem would be difficult, takes long time to fix. And this process that I'm going to share with you would take perhaps hours if not days. And so I'm going to short circuit the process or get to the results much more quickly than would be, than would be real. So, if we want to analyze this problem, we can choose to either focus on the desired behavior, which is staying on task and finding the victim. We know that it has decreased, so we know that it has been punished. And we want to think to ourselves, then let's get rid of those punishers. Or we can focus on the unwanted behavior, wandering through the search site without focus has increased, thus it has been reinforced. I want to get rid of those reinforcers. If this is a serious problem and I cannot find a solution, I would do the exercise that I'm going to do with you right now with both sides of the equation. But it's the same exercise. So I'm just going to do it once and I'm going to focus on the desired behavior. Why? Because I like looking for behavior. It gives me something to reinforce. And second, if the desired behavior has disappeared, it means that it has been punished and I'm a positive reinforcement trainer. Darn it. I don't want there to be a punisher there, so I want to get rid of those punishers. So that's what I'm going to focus on. So what I do is I look at it like a balance, a, a, a true balance in which you weigh things. And on the balance on one side are all the reinforcers, and on the other side of the scale are all the punishers. And I asking myself, okay, finding the victim and staying on task is disappearing. 
what are the reinforcers that I've been trying to offer? What are the punishers that might be affecting the behavior? And what I know for a fact is, if there is a problem, it means that the punishers outweigh the reinforcers. And I know then that to solve the problem, I have to shift the balance of reinforcement. I have to make the reinforcers outweigh the punishers. So, let's look back at our scale. Now, on the screen right now, we have red P's and green R's to represent some punishers and some reinforcers. But let's get rid of those P's and R's and replace them with real things. So in a real training world, I would put big white post-it notes up on the wall and I would ask all of the trainers to say, okay, list for me all of those things that you think were or could reinforce the desired behavior. They list all, oh, we use treats, we use this, we use that. Then I would say, now let's list all the punishers. And of course at first, oh no, no, we don't punish. No, but there's got to be something. And once their imagination takes over, they can list hundreds of things. So I'm only going to list things that fit on this one slide. But usually there'd be 50 things. So as we look at this scale, on the reinforcement side, I say, well, finding the victim is reinforcing. I give the dog his favorite toy. Sometimes I've given the dog treats. So those are the reinforcers. And I say, okay then, what are the punishers? What are the aversives that might be in the environment? And as you start thinking about it, you say, well, maybe it's the fact that there are a lot of distractions when we train. Maybe the task is too difficult. Maybe it's an incident that occurred last month on a real find. The dog came around a corner, found the victim. The victim got startled and punched the dog, and that's what the dog remembers. That's the real story. It, it happens. Um, so, you say, okay, I've got this list of potential reinforcers and punishers. So what we want to do now is see if we can make some changes. We need to get rid of all those things on the punishing side. So first we say, well, let's start setting the task up so that it's really easy, so that it's not hard. As soon as you do that, then you can erase the task being difficult from the equation. Okay, okay, that's no longer an issue. Let's change our training location so there aren't any distractions anymore. So we erase the distractions. And one by one, we begin removing all of the aversives, all of the punishers, until they're all gone or until we've gotten rid of the ones that we can. The painful, scary incident happened in the past. It's already happened. We can't erase it from, its, from the dog's memory. We just have to wait to put it behind it. But once we've eliminated a list of 100 potential punishers and narrowed it down to just one or two, if we have more reinforcers than we have punishers, have we solved the problem? Not necessarily. Sometimes a single punisher can outweigh a whole bunch of reinforcers. Also, sometimes we can find a way if you can, and you can find a way to completely erase all of the punishers. There are no more punishers that you can think of. If the behavior has not come back, what does it tell us? Anything. Anything that's aversive. Anything that's aversive is a punisher, by definition. If it causes behavior to decrease in frequency, it is, by definition, a punisher. So the question becomes, what if you've gotten rid of all potential punishers, you've removed them from the list, but your behavior still hasn't come back. It either means that there's still an aversive or punisher out there that you're not finding, or, see that list of reinforcers? They're not reinforcers. You just thought they were. You called them a reinforcer, but if behavior isn't coming back, they are not reinforcers. And sometimes, a thing that you put in your reinforcement category may actually be an aversive. We found, in this particular case, we started making the find for our dog who'd had an aversive incident, the painful incident, we started making finding the victim easy. And we discovered that that easy task actually was an aversive. This was a good dog who knows, knew how to do stuff and all of a sudden, well, I know the person's right there. Why, I, he didn't seem to like doing it. I equated it with me saying to you, could you do me a favor and say your ABCs? And then you go, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, A. You got through it. Go, good. Could you do it again, please? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Okay, good. good. Could you do it again, please? I did it already. I know this. Why are you making me do this again? This is not challenging. And so suddenly, something easy like saying your ABCs. Can't you imagine if you were asked to repeat it a bunch of times, it would be a little bit aversive? It became a punisher. It became something that made it no fun. You have to look critically at what you're using and ask yourself, is what I thought was a reinforcer really not a reinforcer? 
Maybe it's a frustration aspect, and that is an aversive. So, when I think about balance of reinforcement, identify all the potential reinforcers and punishers out there. If necessary, strengthen and beef up those reinforcers. But more important than that, find a way to remove the punishers. Because if you think about it, think about me trying to teach this class today. If I want you to learn, I have to be able to control the aversives in the environment. If the temperature isn't good, if the sound is poor, if the lighting is awful, if the person sitting next to you you don't like, whatever, all of those things impact your ability to learn. If I want to make sure you learn, I have to get rid of those aversives. I have to make sure that there are things that make learning easier. And that's what we have to do with our pets and with the animals that we work with. And here's the thing. When you uncover the balance of reinforcement and punishment, you have uncovered true motivation. That's what motivation is. Anything you or an animal ever does in its life is motivated by past experience and whether or not that past experience was reinforcing or aversive. A good colleague, a friend of mine, and good colleague uh, at the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago, Tim Sullivan, did a paper at an ABMA conference several years ago on understanding motivation. It's a great paper, but rather than re-quote all 30 minutes of his paper, I'm just going to show you the bullet points that were in his conclusion. And I thought they were excellent. When you think about motivation, keep in mind that the animals like to control their environment. They want control. They want to be able to affect their environment. And the more control they have, the more reinforcing it is. But you also have to remember that animals are selfish. Not a bad way, not in that negative context, but they want to know what's in it for them. What do I get out of this? What do I get for this? Why should I do this for you? What's in it for me? That's what they want to know. Past consequences are what create motivation. You think about it. Any decision you make about whether you're going to go out to the bar with a friend tonight, whether you're going to go to a movie, whether you're going to watch a certain TV show, whether you're going to try a certain restaurant, all is based on past consequences. And you weigh, well, I like that person, but the friend they're coming with I don't like, and i got to decide. And you weigh all of those things, and that's what ultimately helps you decide whether you are or you aren't going to do something. Animals are the same way. They're weighing all the aversives and all the reinforcers, and they decide which wins out. Past consequences are what create motivation. And you've got to remember that animals select the stimuli that are important to them, not the trainer. Oh, we wish we could. We wish we could come and say, hey, I just spent $100 on that toy. You better like it. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way. They decide. And it's a mix of all of these things that really creates an overall motivational balance. We have to be good students of behavior. By watching their behavior, we can then determine whether or not what we're using and working with is working and truly motivating. And it's our ability to control that balance that impacts whether or not an animal learns. If you cannot control their access to reinforcers, if you cannot control the distractors, if you can, cannot control the temperature, whatever it is that impacts that animal, learning is going to be more difficult. The more control you have over that environment, the more likely you are to help channel motivation in a favorable way for you and the behavior you're trying to get. A couple of tangential notes before I get to the next topic. So we've talked about identifying the problem, we've talked about determining the cause, and we've talked about looking at motivation, which is balance of reinforcement and punishment. Now we're almost ready to implement a plan. But before I go there, I have two things that are just sort of tangential. I want to have a note about the ABCs. When you study behavior, you will hear about A stands for antecedent, the trigger, the cue that makes the behavior happen. B stands for behavior, C stands for consequence. And often when we learn about behavior, we always try to tell people that the most important part about behavior is the consequences. Behavior is a function of its consequences. Focus on the consequences. I just finished talking about motivation. It's all about punishers and reinforcers. It's about consequences. But sometimes the student who listens very attently to the fact that behavior is a function of its consequences, then thinks to themselves, so I guess the trigger, the cue, the antecedent, isn't really important, is it? But yes, it's important. Oftentimes, 
The thing that triggers a behavior can cause a behavior to come back quickly. You have to look at those kinds of things, whether it's a location, a specific trainer, a specific smell, a specific set of circumstances, a sound, a certain taste, a certain social hierarchy, a certain time of the day. All of those things can serve as triggers to bring back unwanted behavior. So while consequences may be the most important thing you look at, don't forget the importance of recognizing that there are triggers in the environment that can cause a behavior to happen. And you have to be watchful and mindful of those. Be conscious of those because they can cause behavior to come rushing right back again. Yes? She asked an interesting question. She says when you're looking at your animals and you're watching your animals, um, you have the ability potentially to look around you and see those things that are impacting behavior. But how about when you go online to uh, a tool like YouTube and you watch a video, and you're not really able to see all of the things that impact. That is a real dilemma and it's one of the reasons why looking at a video without a lot of background is good to look at but you're not necessarily getting the whole story. And so consequently, it's a difficult thing to evaluate. You really have to, I've done a lot of consulting where people have sent me videos and I've often said, you know what, I need you to widen your camera lens the next time you send me that video. I need to see more. I need to know about the temperature. I need to know about things that I can't see on that video because there are a lot of things in the environment that impact behavior. And it's very difficult to get that from just watching a video. There's a sharp trainer can see certain things, but it takes a lot more than that. And it's not an easy thing to do. I want to say one other thing before going to implementing a plan, and it's about setting priorities. In fact, in some cases, this is the single most important question I can ask when I come in as a consultant. How important is solving this particular problem? Because you've got to keep in mind that before you implement a plan, determining where it fits into your priority list is key. So often we say, I really, really want to fix this problem. But it turns out it's not that high on the priority list and that's why you haven't fixed it. I, I, I moved into my current house in Chicago eight years ago. Under the stairs leading to my basement are tons of boxes that I have yet to unpack. And I continually say to myself, I really, really need to unpack these boxes. It's really important to me. Well, the fact that I haven't done it yet means that it's too low on my priority list. Otherwise, they would have been impacted already. Oftentimes, when there is a problem behavior, I always have to ask the client, how important is this to you? Oh, it's really important. Well, then let's start talking about it. And you have to also keep in mind, does your list equal your family's list or the institution's list? Sometimes I go into a, 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 a zoo or an aquarium or go to a family, and it's just one person that has this as a problem. Nobody else in the family or no one else in the organization thinks it's a, a big deal. That's why you can't solve the problem because not everybody is on the same page about whether or not it's a problem or not. You know, oftentimes we have, we all agree that certain problems need to be fixed, but ultimately they're just too low on the priority list and we can't fix them. And I always have to ask the client, are you willing to sacrifice something to fix this problem? I mean, what do you mean? I said, well, if it was easy to fix, you would have fixed it already. So to fix it, I can't just come in and go abracadabra behavior be fixed. It doesn't work that way. You have to change something. You're going to either have to change your behavior. You're going to have to change your time commitment. You're going to have to put some money into certain resources. Something's got to be changed for you to fix this problem. And oftentimes, I'll come into a situation and go, oh, no, no, I don't want to spend that money. Oh, okay. Well, how about if we could rearrange your work schedule so you could have more time off with your dog? Oh, no, 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 I'm not going to take vacation time for my dog. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Um, how, about, how about spending a little bit more training time? No, 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 I don't have time for that. I'm a busy guy. Well, at some point, you're saying, well, then this problem really isn't that important to you, is it? What they're looking for is a magic bullet. And oftentimes, I find myself really having to juggle priorities and say, you need to figure out how to set your priorities right. Once you decide this is important enough, then we can fix the problem. I was telling somebody last night that sometimes I often feel more like a marriage counselor than a trainer because I'm coming in with a client and I'm trying to get this guy and this girl to agree on what they want their dog to do. 
Training the dog to do that particular behavior isn't going to be hard. What's hard is that the two of them don't agree on what they want their dog to do or how they want their dog to behave. So you have to look at finding priorities so that within an organization or within a household, everybody is looking for the same thing and there's a consistency in the approach. I want to jump and wrap up here by talking about untraining undesirable behavior. And, and I just thought for ease, all so far everything I've shared with you today has come from a variety of different resources. Karen Pryor's list of things that she uses to get rid of unwanted behavior from Don't Shoot the Dog is not a comprehensive list, but it's a resource that most people are aware of and it's a kind of a good list or at least a good place to start. So Karen Pryor suggests that if you want to untrain undesirable behavior, you can do one of eight things. You can shoot the dog, you can use punishment, you can use negative reinforcement, you can use extinction, you can put the behavior on cue, you can train an incompatible behavior, which by the way is scientifically referred to as DRI, differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior. You can shape the absence of the behavior, which is referred to as differential reinforcement of other behavior, or you can change the motivation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because I'm hopeful that all of you either have Don't Shoot the Dog or can get access to it. But let me just go over each one briefly so that you understand how once you've discovered what the problem is and what the motivation is, it'll help you figure out which of these tools to use. Well, shoot the dog, obviously that's not really a training technique. <laughs> However, even in its broadest context, shooting the dog is what a lot of people do. When they, do, when they in essence, give the animal away for adoption, they may not be shooting the dog, but they're really saying, I'm giving up on this dog. I don't want to train it anymore. Or sometimes people just give up training. I love my dog, I'm not going to give it up, but I'm not going to try training it anymore. That's still the shoot the dog technique, I'm not going to work on the problem. In essence, that's the, the, the premise behind divorce in our society. It's not that a couple actually shoots each other, although maybe they want to. The reality is, they're just saying, I'm walking away from this marriage, I don't want to work on it anymore. That is the shoot the dog technique. Not a training technique, but there may be times when simply saying, you know what? I'm not going to work on this anymore. I don't want to train this behavior. Maybe that's the solution. Not the most positive solution and certainly not a training solution. Punishment. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about punishment, but the fact of the matter is, as we've talked about before, proper application of punishment will decrease behavior. It is a scientific fact. But we also know if we've done enough of our studies that use of punishment has the potential for causing other problems. It creates frustration, it can create a variety of problems, and so it is not the option of choice for most trainers. Most of us who approach training from a positive reinforcement standpoint feel that punishment is a, a tool of last resort and one that we don't necessarily uh, like to focus on, but it is certainly a traditional approach I think it's an outdated technique, at least it's outdated in the sense of going to it first. But it does work. It's a tool that you need to be aware of, just not one that I personally advocate under most situations. Negative reinforcement. Again, we haven't talked about all these concepts in detail, and it's beyond the scope of what I want to talk about today, but it is the preferable flip side to punishment. Why? Well, although it still requires the use of an aversive stimulus, it gives the animal the option to do the correct behavior. You're giving the animal a chance to do the correct behavior and if properly used, it can be an effective choice. Not a topic for discussion today, but certainly I encourage those of you who are not as familiar with some of these choices to look at Don't Shoot the Dog or look at some of the scientific literature to look at punishment and negative reinforcers. And extinction. I've talked about that briefly earlier today as well. What is extinction? Well, by definition, it means that reinforcement of a previously reinforced behavior is discontinued. Unless you re stop reinforcing a previously reinforced behavior, then it's not called extinction. Now, the thing about it is it is part of the theory behind an LRS. I haven't talked about that, so I won't even go there if you're not familiar with it. It's part of the idea when trainers say, ignore the unwanted behavior, why are you ignoring the unwanted behavior? Because you're hoping to minimize the chances that you might reinforce that behavior. And so that is an effort to use extinction. You can only use extinction though if you know what the reinforcer is. If you don't know what the reinforcer is, you have to use some other technique. 
because you can't extinguish something if you don't know what the reinforcer is. You can try, but you really have to go elsewhere with it. And the thing about extinction is like the dinosaurs, it takes time. Just because you stop reinforcing a behavior doesn't mean it will automatically go away. In fact, sometimes the reverse is true. There is a phenomenon called an extinction burst, meaning the animal is so used to receiving reinforcement that when it suddenly stops, they try harder. They try with more enthusiasm because it used to get them reinforcement. The best example I can give you is if you go to a vending machine that has candy and chips and soda, and you put your quarter, well, quarter, you put your dollar bills <laughs> into the vending machine, you push the button and your product doesn't come out, how many people go, oh well, and walk away? Nobody. At the very least, you'll push the button a second time. You'll push it several times in succession. You'll push it harder. You'll shake the machine. You'll kick the machine. Eventually, you walk away. That was an extinction burst. You don't just give up because it didn't pay off. When an animal is used to receiving reinforcement, they go, this worked before, let me try again. Well, how about now? And they, they, they try harder and harder and it can be frustrating. You don't always see an extinction burst when you use extinction, but you need to be aware that it's a possibility. And like anything else, you don't have to choose just one tool. You can try to refrain from reinforcing an undesirable behavior, but you can combine it with other tools as well. A couple other tools that Karen talks about is putting the behavior on cue. Putting the behavior on cue gives the trainer more control over the behavior. You put it on cue, then you ask for it from time to time. This spitting behavior is a good example. Our beluga whales love to spit. It's the way they find food items. So they learn very early if they spit at us that we would scream and run away. Oh, it's cold water and we'd run. And I think that was very reinforcing for them. So, <laughs> The way we got rid of it is we first used extinction, we quit responding. If they spit at us, we just let them spit and we didn't respond. Then we taught them to do it on cue so that they would do it when we wanted them to. So we could wait until we were dressed appropriately. We were in the right wetsuit or something. Then we would ask for the behavior. But it does require you to ask for the behavior from time to time. Almost all of us have used this cue. If you have ever trained your dog to pee or poop outside instead of inside, you're taking a behavior and you're not saying, don't ever in your life ever poop again. <laughs> you're simply saying, I would prefer it if you would do it out here. You're putting the behavior on cue. It's a really elegant choice for certain types of behaviors. I don't believe it works for certain extreme behaviors, like aggression. Aggression is, serves a function. And so just because you teach an animal to bark on cue or growl on cue, they'll learn to growl on cue. They'll be a great actor, go, okay, I'll growl when you want me to. But that doesn't gonna keep them from growling and barking in other situations when the circumstances warrant it. And you do have to present the cue from time to time. If you forget to take your dog out and let him pee outdoors, he's gonna have to pee eventually. You have to ask for the behavior once in a while or they will quit doing it on cue. They will they go, well, you're not asking for it. If it's a behavior they like, if it's a behavior they need, it's a behavior that's important to them, you have to ask them to present the behavior from time to time. One of my favorites is training an incompatible behavior. I use this for aggression problems. I use this for lots of stuff. Technically, it's referred to as DRI, Differential Reinforcement of Incompatible Behavior. It is a form of redirection. What you're saying to the animal is, I don't want you to do this behavior, but I would, be, would love it if you did this behavior instead. In fact, I'm gonna train you to do this behavior that's incompatible with the unwanted behavior because you can't do both. It's a form of redirection often referred to as alternative response training, differential reinforcement of alternative responses. And in the literature, there is DR fill in the blank. There's DRI, DRO, DRL, DRS. There's a whole bunch of them, but they're all redirection techniques. DRI, to me, is the best one of the bunch. It is a very powerful tool, so powerful that I feel, felt like I should show you a video about it. Let me show you two kinds, two different examples of DRI. This first one is with those cute otters that we told you about. Those otters love to hold on to us and grab us. So when we want to do medical behaviors, we teach them to hold on to a target before we touch them. 
They can't grab our hand and grab the target at the same time. So by teaching them to hold on to a target, it is incompatible with grabbing onto our hand. Because they were all hand raised from the oil spill, we needed to keep their busy paws and mouths occupied, so we taught them to hold on to something whenever we needed to do a medical exam and touch them, because they can't do both. When they're on land, we literally have them touch their, their, their nose and their paws to the wall because they cannot <laughs> grab us or bite us. That's incompatible. Touch your nose, touch your paw to the wall, and you cannot bite or grab us. Incompatible behavior. I'll show you my little puppy at home. Not a puppy anymore, but I love having my dog in the house. I like it, but I don't like her begging at the table. So what I did was instead of saying, don't do this, well, what is it you want me to do, Dad? Well, I want you to go to your kennel. If you will go to your kennel, I will reinforce you there. You cannot be in the kennel and begging at the table at the same time. They are mutually exclusive behaviors and thus it's an incompatible behavior. Now, when I first start training it, my poor little dog is going, okay, am I getting a treat now? Do I get a treat now? But now, years later, she goes into her kennel and sleeps for 45 minutes. So just stay there, and I don't have to reinforce her until it's over. At the beginning, I reinforce her every two or three minutes and gradually increase the amount of time between reinforcers until now she doesn't look at me so attentively. She sleeps while we're having dinner. But those are both examples of DRI. Train an incompatible behavior. You can't do both things. So instead of saying, I don't want you to do this, well, what is it you want me to do? This is what I'd like you to do instead. A similar technique, but slightly different, is shaping the absence of a behavior. DRO, differential reinforcement of other behavior. It's a passive form of alternative response training. The only real difference is you can use it in non-training situations. Instead of teaching the animal to do a specific behavior that's incompatible, you are just willing to shape or train or take or reinforce any behavior other than the unwanted behavior. I walk in, and I have a dog and a cat who are always fighting. And I walk in and go, well, look at that. They're sleeping side by side. They're nuzzling each other. That's not incompatible with being aggressive to one another, but it is getting along. So I'm going to just reinforce the fact that they're getting along. Any behavior other than the fighting, chasing, or whatever, I will reinforce. That's shaping the absence of behavior. And finally, Karen suggests changing the motivation. I already talked about this. Consider the balance of reinforcement. Look at your reinforcers. Look at the aversives that might be in the environment. Get rid of the aversives if you can. Be careful about making assumptions about motivation. It will get you in trouble. I think my dog is jealous because of this or because of that. And I'm not suggesting, as Trisha talked about yesterday, I'm not suggesting that animals don't feel jealousy. I think they probably do. But I do think if you're not careful and you just make an assumption about what they're feeling and don't base it on what you see the behavior they're doing is, it can lead you down the wrong path. We have enough trouble assessing motivations of each other, much less the animals that we work with. But if you understand the factors that affect motivation, you can make a significant impact on behavior. Let me show you one last video that I think is just fun, and then we're going to wrap this topic up and take a break. Um, I want to show you, I work with an organization that really wanted a reliable recall with their animals. We all need a good recall. I believe when you sound a recall, your animal should drop what it's doing and come running, swimming, flying back to you at top speed. It should be the, I can't wait to come back. The problem is so often recalls are not trained very well, and what happens is we tend to use recalls when an animal's doing something wrong, when it's time to end playtime. We're in the park and our dogs are playing, we recall them, we put the leash on them and take them home, and they go, oh, recall means I don't get to play anymore. And so what happens is the motivation to respond to the recall is low. To change that motivation, you have to use the behavior frequently and it has to have a good reinforcement rate. So I was working with an organization on trying to make really strong recalls with their California sea lions. Not particularly fond of this loud, sharp whistle that they use, but it's something the animals can hear from a great distance away. And um, I'll just let you watch. This is a recall that is really strong. I'm gonna turn this down because you don't need to hear the loud whistle. Oh, you can hear it, it's not too bad. You know, this is the early training, just teaching the animal that whatever you're doing, if you respond to that loud whistle and come to where you hear it, 
you will receive high levels of reinforcement. It doesn't matter if you're being fed, if you're being trained, you hear the recall signal, drop what you're doing and go to the trainer. There you can see it. This is the early stages of training it. And often it doesn't even, they don't even know where the whistle's coming from. They hear it, there's the whistle. They come racing out to back to go to where that sound is. And we constantly test the recall by doing it in the middle of sessions. Now, don't worry about what the, the, the video is going to have some uh, subtitles here in a second that aren't related to this topic today. So you can read the subtitles, but they don't relate here. Here, this, this animal did not even know a trainer was in the area. It was free time. They hear the whistle, they come running over to it. That's an easy one. But we really worked hard with these animals. Here, we, this animal's in a training session. The trainer that's going to sound the recall is backstage. And what you're going to see, what I love about this is the animal hears the recall. It just finished doing a behavior correctly. It waits to get reinforced from its trainer on land here. Then it races to the recall. Watch this. <laughs> the recall sound started before. Here, this is even getting the animal to come. These kind of animals, they can't get to the trainer without going into a kennel. So they go into the kennel to get to that trainer to receive their reinforcement for the recall. Here, this animal doesn't even finish the behavior. Halfway through the behavior, I don't think you can hear the whistle. For some reason, it doesn't show up. There's the whistle, and the animal just leaves. Says, I heard the recall signal. <laughs> the reason the animals respond so well is because we made the motivation strong. Final step in the problem-solving situations that I'm talking about is don't forget to constantly monitor the problem. You've got to keep good records, especially when it comes to fixing behavioral problems. What you have to remember is problem behavior may be gone, but it is never forgotten. <laughs> Once an animal knows how to dig up the garden, it always knows how to dig up the garden. Once an animal knows how to be aggressive, they always know how to be aggressive. You can Get, get the behavior gone from their repertoire, but it can be triggered again relatively easily. So, all I've shared with you today is the matrix, that five-step process. Identify the problem, determine the cause, look at motivation, implement a plan, and constantly monitor the plan. I think each of us has to find the right approach for us. The approach that I've shared with you may not be the perfect approach for your program. This is just one system. It's a system that works for me. Look for a process that works for you. A systematic approach will guide your journey toward a solution. We all are going to experience and encounter problematic behavior. It's up to us to use the scientific tools at our disposal and put a plan in place that will guide us toward a successful solution. Thank you.